My name is Melanie Barker and I am the Executive and Clinical Director of San Diego State University's Driving Under the Influence Program and also a lecturer in the School of Social Work at San Diego State University. I'm honored to be here to interview Georgie DiStefano. And this interview has taken place for the inclusion in the California Social Welfare Archives Oral History Collection as part of her induction to the California Social Work Hall of Distinction. Georgie has been my mentor, my friend, and was my clinical supervisor when I first graduated. I nominated Georgie with Dr. Melinda Homan, the director of the School of Social Work at San Diego State University, for Georgie's exceptional leadership, innovation, clinical insight, supervision, and technical competencies. She's really been innovative in the development of the management information systems within the DUI program. Melanie, I want to thank you very much for being here today and for taking the time to do this interview and for also assuming responsibility for the directorship of the DUI program at San Diego State University. I know I've left it in very good hands. Well, Georgia, it's really an honor to be here with you. And I'm wondering if you could tell us how you became a social worker and what really influenced you to enter into the field. I would very much like to and I would like to also thank the um, Social Work Hall of Distinction for, th for this honor. I came from a very large Italian family. Uh, we were brought up to, uh, to really respect the notion of, of giving back and of uh, doing our fair share. And teaching and social work were just always two, um, two areas I was always drawn to from a very, very young age. And so um, when I finished uh, high school, I actually began in, in nursing, to be honest, and uh, realized that I was kind of in the right area <clears throat> but not quite in the right profession because I liked talking to the patients more than I liked administering to their needs. So after about a semester of nursing school, I switched over uh, to, um, to a bachelor's program and then went on to my social work degree. What was the social, economic, and political climate at the time that you entered social work? Well, I graduated from uh, Stony Brook University in New York and in 1974 to 1976 I went to school and what was very fascinating at that time was the um, the mental health issues. The big state hospitals in New York were letting go of real, literally hundreds of mental health patients. There was a policy um, reaction to the large mental health institutions. They felt that they were snake pits, people felt uh, uh, there was a tremendous amount of abuse, uh, uh, patients were uh, poorly diagnosed and so the reaction to this was legislation that uh, emptied a lot of the uh, uh, mental hospitals and mental facilities and I think today in hindsight we realize that while the intentions of those policies were very good uh, people came out of those institutions with very few services or resources we really were not prepared to, uh, to handle uh, these people uh, in the community, to provide them the kind of services that they really needed in the community. And so I remember at a very young age uh, recognizing that we really need to be very careful when we implement our policies, that there's unanticipated consequences. And that lesson um, really stayed with me. In that township, as part of my um, internship for social work school, I began to work with the Youth Development Corporation, which was part of the, uh, one of the uh, departments of the town. And the supervisor at that point in time decided to put the Youth Bureau under his supervision. And my job uh, and my internship was to go to the various villages and, and hamlets and have each community develop their own youth board and to select activities that they thought were more important for their community. So we, it was the beginning of our, my community organization experience. And so the communities would choose and select uh, how they would like to use their money. Uh, did they want counseling programs, after school programs, sports programs? They would make those decisions and then we would help put those programs together. And what was really gratifying in preparation for this interview, uh, I went on the, the internet 
and uh, lo and behold, the Youth Bureau is still there 37 years later and uh, still has uh, an executive director, still under the, uh, the, um, the supervisor's uh, department and still providing uh, services in those communities that we set up 37 years ago. So that was very, uh, very gratifying. It's amazing. And so I was going to ask you how your career developed. I'm wondering if you could kind of expand um, on, on that and really what your area of focus was. Well, when I finished with uh, and graduated from Stony Brook University, I went on to a social work teaching position uh, at uh, Harbor Fields High School on Long Island. It was a very unique position because I had really had an opportunity to blend both my teaching certification and my social work uh, background. And we had an alternative school program where we had children who were uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. They had histories of failure. They uh, did not look promising at all for them to graduate. And we were trying very hard to keep them from dropping out of school. They were not um, classified, to, they had not gone to, uh, to um, uh, through a classification process, so they were able to be uh, treated in groups. And so we had the alternative school program as a means to see if we could keep them in, you know, involved in school and not, not drop out. It, what was interesting is a uh, graduate student did a study on the program. And, and don't hold me to this, but I believe the statistics were that at the time I started, about 13% of the kids were completing high school, and when I left five years later, 76% were entering college. And it was a wonderful experience. I loved it. It was my favorite job um, and uh, wonderful experiences. And those kids taught me so many things that I use, have used throughout my career. You know, you really learn how to be a public speaker because uh, if you wanted to keep their attention, you really needed to get to the heart of the subject and make it interesting and it had to be compelling. And so any success that I've had as a trainer, I, I, I really um, acknowledge the, the kids for that. Uh, curriculum development, you had to keep your curriculums interesting and, and uh, uh, viable and I, I give the kids really credit for that also. So they really were the, uh, the impetus but, uh, in me looking at material and saying, okay, what's the heart of this material? What do I need? What don't I need? And how can I make this relevant to them? And I, I give them credit for that also. So it was a wonderful experience. It was five amazing years. And I learned a lot about motivation. You know, a lot of these, um, a lot of these kids were really marked in the school. And what we really were doing was behavior modification on the teachers. That teachers, once they thought a kid was, you know, a bad kid, then there was no changing of that perception. And so what we really worked on was changing the teacher's perceptions of these kids. And it was, a, it was amazing experience. We helped the kids gain confidence. And it was the very beginning also of working with children of alcoholics. It was before we had a lot of even, even the terminology that we have today. We used to have what we call rap groups. And I would work with kids whose parents were alcoholic and uh, you know, who would call me in the middle of the night because their parents were fighting in another room or they were you know, you know, traumatized by something that was happening uh, in the home environment. And so it really was a, uh, an opportunity to really understand some of the pressures on children and how we can help them uh, and the kinds of services that w would be important to them. You've had such a successful career. I'm wondering, um, were you always so successful or did you ever face real obstacles? A tremendous amount of obstacles over time because when I um, when I left the uh, the school and, and truthfully I really didn't want to leave the school. The first obstacle really was a personal one, and that is that I'm a lesbian. And in the late 80s, uh, I'm sorry, the early 80s, it was very difficult to um, to have a life, uh, and you cannot could not be out on Long Island. It was a very conservative uh, environment. And the kids would want to come to my home, and I lived in the community, and you really had to, it was, you know, it was not a nine to five. You really were interfacing with the children a lot. And it became very clear to me that my personal freedoms were, were being greatly curtailed. And so I made the decision, uh, my mother was in California, and I made the decision to move to support her because of her health needs. And when I came out here, I decided to leave working with kids and work with adults so that I would have more personal freedom. And I believe that was really a, a very difficult obstacle for me because uh, I, really, I really did love teaching and I really did love children. 
But I left uh, that and I came to, uh, to San Diego and I began working uh, at, at Mesa Vista Hospital, which is a psychiatric hospital, and I worked on the chemical dependency unit and the acute care psychiatric unit. And that's really where I honed my skills and really had an appreciation for some of the psychiatric issues that really affected so many clients and also the substance abuse issues. And I really saw the, the, uh, the connection between those two things. And again, back in the 80s, there was very little connection between the substance abuse field and the mental health field. Uh, counselors were not trained on either end of, of, of the spectrum and it was really difficult to, um, to get both of those, those areas to kind of talk to each other. And that really became one of my focal points in working. So I spent about five years uh, at Mesa Vista in the inpatient unit working with clients. And one of the issues economically that uh, uh, really spoke to me is, you know, we had just come out of a, a recession in the 80s and treatment was very expensive. And we had, you know, quote, a war on drugs. Well, how do you have a war on drugs and treatment not affordable for a good part of the population? And that question um, really concerned me. And uh, I spoke about it a lot. And one of my friends was a uh, psychiatrist. And one day uh, he asked me to come with him for a, uh, for a ride and uh, on, our lunch, <coughs> excuse me, on our lunch hour. And we went to a building. And I walked in, it was a beautiful old house here uh, in the Hillcrest area of San Diego. And he said, what do you think of, uh, of this place? I said, oh, it's beautiful, you know, thinking of buying it. And he said, I own it. How would you like to open up your outpatient clinic here? And I looked at him and I said, are you serious? And he said, it's yours. He said, do what you want to do. I think you're, gonna, I think you're right about treatment services. And so I opened up the Counseling and Recovery Institute. And that really was my life's work. I mean, it was a, a phenomenal institute. We hired great staff, had wonderful clinicians. We provided individual uh, therapy on our top level and had programs uh, on the bottom level uh, of the facility. And we really treated a wide range of, of uh, uh, substance abuse and mental health disorders. Uh, and it really was, uh, Roar Industries did a study and our, our program um, had incredibly high ra uh, ranking of people who stayed employed and, and were able to be successful in their recovery. And so, uh, sadly, managed care came on the scene, and I say sadly because at that time when they first came uh, into the business, they did not allow groups to have contracts. And so all the therapists that worked for me, who were employees, uh, could not go on as a group. They had to go on as individual providers, which meant that if they left, I couldn't get anyone on the provider panels. And so our business plan became, it was not possible to have a business plan. And so I recognized that and I said, we're really gonna have to close our doors. There's no way in the next year or two that this is gonna be able to stay a viable business. And as it turned out, I was right. My prediction on that was right. Uh, and so we closed. Uh, the Counseling Recovery Institute, but it was a first-rate outpatient program, and we did a lot of things that uh, I was very proud of uh, uh, in that institute. And so when I left there, uh, I then went to, uh, to Kaiser. A friend of mine uh, had been ill and asked me to do some substituting, and uh, unfortunately she passed away, and uh, after that they asked me if I would stay on. And so I had reopened my practice and I stayed on. And it was interesting because I did the front end of the disease, the assessment end of the disease. And that became really fascinating because I began to look at how do we motivate people to go into treatment. You know, I'd worked on the inpatient and the outpatient treatment side once people recognized they had a problem. But how do you motivate people to see that they have a problem? And that became an interesting part of the work. And I did that for a number of years uh, until um, Dr. Ned Smith uh, had lunch with me one day and she said, why don't you come over to San Diego State and work in the DUI program? And to be honest, I said, why in the world would I want to work in the DUI program? Uh, it's a compliance program, it's people are in and out, and, you know, why would I want to do that? And she said to me, it's a very interesting question, she said, how many people do you think you treat a year uh, in your outpatient program? And I said, you know, 150, 200 people. She said, well, right now we're treating about 2,000 people a week. And when I left and I retired from the DUI, we were treating 3,000 people a week. And she said, if you're really serious about creating treatment models, this is the place to be. And I thought about what she said and I said, boy, this makes a lot of sense. And so as you know, I became practically obsessed with, okay, how do we treat large numbers of people, personalize the treatment, make it effective, 
and do it with the 20 minutes the state thinks is enough time to provide treatment. And that really became the challenge. And from that, uh, that's where I developed the Paradigm Developmental Model of Treatment and the Group Topic Manual. And again, I go back to the kids uh, in my alternative school program because it was the lessons I learned there of you have to, treatment has to feel personalized. People have to feel that you're talking about them, that it's about them. And so how do we take something that looks like a cookie cutter and personalize it for the client so it speaks to them? That was, that was really the, the gist of it. And then for the, for the counselor, what do I do? and when do I do it? Those were the, the questions that I spent 15 years formulating and trying to work on um, the model for. I want to go back and, and uh, you know, ask about some of the strategies that you used when you started at the DUI program at a time when counselors didn't have the skill sets that we see required today. It was a very difficult time uh, because many of the DUI programs that were owned in the state at that time were privately owned. Uh, they were not run by social workers or by clinicians or by professionals. Uh, a lot of people had a lot of heart and a lot of caring but did not know about mental health disorders. And when I would go to meetings and I, many, many times I, I would say, what am I doing here? I, I really felt like you know, I, I was a square pig in a round hole. Uh, what am I doing here? They, they, they really were looking at me like, are you crazy? We can't do this. What are you talking about? And yet I would see these repeat offenders, people coming in, two and three DUIs, and no one was asking, are they bipolar? You know, are they suffering from depression? Is something else going on with this individual that's contributing to the fact that they can't be successful? You're just putting them back into the same curriculum and expecting, you know, a different result, which is the definition of insanity. So uh, it was a, it was it was difficult, and it took a, a long time to uh, I think to win their trust, for them to see that you know uh, I was not trying to bankrupt them uh, with expensive treatment models, and I was trying to come up with something that was cost effective, with designs where their counselors just needed to recognize there was a problem and then send them to a clinical team, a team of people who could do a further assessment, so that we could provide people with resources and they would know, well maybe the reason that you went back to drinking, maybe the reason that you've relapsed is that something is happening that's not diagnosed. And perhaps if you're able to attend to that, it will increase your odds of being able to stay clean and sober. And so that, you know, that took quite a bit of time. And I think a pivotal uh, moment was when the state, um, there was a movement to uh, certify the counselors in the state of California. A lot of the, um, a lot of the owners of DOI programs were, a, a, were concerned about paying too much for counselors, but on the other hand, recognized that they had to increase salaries or they were going to lose uh, employees in the state of California. They had to keep up with a living wage. And so counseling certification ended up being approved. We, they were able to approve it. Once that was accomplished, I was able to really use that. And it was uh, uh, really kind of st a strategic um, by kind of strategic design because I, was, I actually went and did a conference where I tried to explain to these uh, various owners around the state, once the counselors are certified, it's just not a matter of giving them CEUs. Now they're bound by ethics by, by, and by protocols. And their main job as a counselor is assessment and referral. So they're gonna need assessment instruments and they're gonna need referral resources. And so if they assess someone as being depressed, they need to make a referral. They need assessment instruments and they need referral resources. And that was the big breakthrough, uh, that we were able to, to show the logic of that and how important it was to really change how treatment is done in the state. Under your leadership at the DUI program, the outcome uh, enrollment to completions were quite high. And I think the certification process was part of that. But I really wonder if you can, you've touched on the paradigm developmental model of treatment and the group topic, but 
books, I'm wondering if you could expand a little bit more, um, because I think that that really has had an impact on the successes in the, in the program. The basis of the paradigm model is that as a person thinks about their dilemma uh, with drinking, is it do I have a problem or don't I have a problem? And so that's the first piece. Uh, we, we call it, do, am I pickle or am I a cucumber? You know, do I have a problem or don't I have a problem? Was it, was it just a, uh, you know, a terrible cop uh, and a bad judge? Or you know, was I stopped because this is you know, the 14th time I've driven in the last month intoxicated? So the first they have to figure that out. And then they'll go through more, more of a thinking process. Once that's determined, the next thing is, what is impacting my ability to stay clean and sober? Is there a condition that I'm not dealing with? Maybe it's an anger management problem. Do you know? Uh, maybe it's financial pressures, other issues that they have to take a look at. Maybe it's a mental health situation. And then how do I self-regulate? How do I stay clean and sober so that it's not something I do for 30 days, but something that I can have for a lifetime? So these are what, what I call paradigm shifts. And I began, I, I began to notice with our counselors as I would listen in on their counseling sessions that they would be telling someone about a recovery activity and I, I'd be listening in and uh, as I'd walk in the hallway or, or whatever and I'd say to myself, that client doesn't even think they have a problem yet and they're talking about recovery services. They're not meeting the client where they're at. And the basis of motivational interviewing is to really work with the client and work with the resistance and work where they're at. And so the paradigm model takes cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational interviewing, the two leading uh, methods that we use in substance abuse treatment, and helps the counselor understand what to do and when to do it. And so we developed interventions based on where the client is in their thinking process. We came up with a scale that's a validated scale at the university where they're able to answer several questions. And from that, the uh, uh, counselor can see, okay, this person is not buying any of this. They're, they're, they don't think they have a problem. In which case, the counselor should just try to bond with the person, try to make the time useful, and engage in a relationship so that they win their trust and perhaps will start to think about it. Or they may have a client who says, yeah, I really think I have a problem. It's my second DUI. And I really do think uh, there's something going on here. Then we have interventions based on helping that person have a, a fuller understanding of that issue. And those interventions will help them move forward in that. Other people's, people may say, you know, I have it, I've been going to meetings, I know I need to do something, and so the interventions would be based on strengthening those understandings and strengthening that behavior. So we set our interventions up based on where the client really is at. And so this is a way of personalizing the uh, curriculum and yet still having one that can address 3,000 people at one time. Uh, and we think it's been very effective because we're talking to the issues of the client. The client knows this is about them. It's not about somebody else. It's about the issues that are the most important to them. And we talk to our, our uh, counselors about you know, speaking the language of the client. If the client's worried about their job, talk job. If the client's worried about keeping their girlfriend, talk relationships. You want to speak in the language of the client. And so we put these techniques together to come up with this curriculum that can be uh, easily taught and where the counselor has a, has a guide. And so we would give this um, a scale, by the way, during the course of their treatment to see if they had improved in their understanding of their relationship with drugs and alcohol. And it really was amazing how the client would gain a greater understanding. I use this every day in my private practice still with clients that they're able to, we're using different interventions as they grow in their understanding of their relationship with alcohol and other drugs. So you were doing this all at the same time that you were developing the ON system, and I'm wondering if you can kind of speak to um, the technological advances that you brought forth in the DUI program. My Lord, I forgot about the ON system. Yes, the ON system. Well, you know, we were very fortunate uh, before the recession to um, be at the university, and I knew that I had the resources at that time to be able to invest in our infrastructure. And I knew there were so many small programs because I was, I was working with them that did not have uh, resources. 
And so what we did for our program is we, we uh, basically went from a uh, handwritten file to an online program where all our, all our notes were online and our, um, our scales were online so that everything could be uh, put into the computer. And it's funny that, that I did this because I have very few computer skills, but because of that, I was really able to come up with a product that is um, very intuitive and very counselor oriented. And so we were able to um, use technology to really advance our work with the, uh, with the paradigm model and for our clinical team and for our counselors. So everything is available to them. All their group topics are online, all their work is online and uh, made it easier for them to write their group notes and whatnot. And then uh, we gained the permission of the university to, at a fraction of the cost of development, just really a fraction of that cost, make it available for other programs in the community to buy it. And that money went and supported the Center on Substance Abuse at the university. So it was a real win-win. That program, small programs, it was based on uh, the amount of users. Small programs with just 10 counselors could buy a program that cost thousands upon thousands of dollars to develop and would have that technology available to them to be able to, uh, to address the needs of their population. Thank you. I'm wondering also, um, just, there's been so many changes recently in in the DUI community um, and service delivery, what have been some of the major socio-political changes that you've seen during your career? And and certainly with the recession in two thousand eight, what what did you have to do to adjust? Well, interesting. There's, there's, there would be several answers to that question. You know, one of the biggest I think political changes for me, you know, starting from uh, why I left teaching, is. Um, the fact that uh, you know gays and lesbians are gaining the right to marry, uh, you know, across the United States, and I'm very heartened by that uh, development. I know um, I married in 2006 in Canada, and 20 of my friends flew with me and my partner, and we'll be together 40 years this June. Uh, and then we had to come. We came back to the United States, and then 80 of our family members came to uh, another uh, uh, wedding here. Another. Uh, ceremony, but it would have been nice to have one ceremony and it would have been nice to have for that ceremony to have happened here. The other experience I had, which was quite, really um, took me by surprise, is when Proposition 8 happened in, in California. Uh, I've lived here all my life and I've always uh, been very proud of my country and I've always been, uh, I've always, you know, felt very respected. But after Proposition 8, I really felt like a second class citizen. I truly did. I was very surprised at my own reaction. Uh, I know in uh, San Diego we have uh, what's called December Nights, and it's an event I, I've always loved and I always love going to. And, and uh, I remember uh, the year that Proposition 8 happened, I went and I couldn't stay. Uh, I just couldn't stay. I felt, you know, I just felt um, very discriminated against. And uh, so I'm very happy to see that the issue is before the Supreme Court. I think it needs to be. I think there are still many, many people that uh, are suffering from uh, uh, bias in employment and in housing, uh, let alone the right to, to marry. And I think it's an issue that needs to be addressed uh, and, uh, and continue to be focused on. Because I think there's so many talented uh, gay and lesbian transgender uh, individuals that, that uh, can make important contributions and oftentimes are you know, stymied in, in, in that because of uh, the prejudice that, that exists. What do you think, that being one of them, what are the most pressing issues for social workers to uh, address today? I think one of the most pressing issues, actually uh, President Obama just recently mentioned it in his State of the Union, and I really think it's the, um, uh, the impact on our middle class. I think if you look at uh, countries around the world, there is always a, uh, uh, there's always the rich, and there is the poor. But the thing that has made America so great has been our middle class. And our middle class has been able to, a strong middle class really raises uh, the, the economy for everyone. And it's our middle class that uh, is involved in, in volunteerism. And it's our middle class that helps to uh, provide opportunities um, for, our, uh, uh, for our poor and our indigent. I really believe that a strong middle class uh, economically does so much to help you know, to help our country. And so I really think that we need to be involved in um, 
making sure that we preserve the gains that we have for our middle class, uh, especially into the 21st century, and making sure that uh, there's, you know, there's going to be a, a quality of, uh, you know, in terms of compensation, uh, that we have those things and that people are well trained and that we have educationally people have the opportunity to be reskilled for the, for the, for the coming years. I think it's extremely important. I'm wondering if, you know, reflecting back over your career, if you had to do it over again, would you do anything differently? And um, what might others learn, those people that are entering the field of social work, what might they learn from your experiences? Well, one of the things that I, I learned, and I've actually come to really appreciate, is that I think social workers need to have a better business background. I know I realized after having my own business and when I went to San Diego State, I always kept the double title of executive director, clinical director, because I always wanted to protect the clinical. And in order to protect the clinical, I had to be in charge of, of the business. And so I think it's important for social workers to embrace uh, the notion of business so that they can understand how to do things in a cost-effective manner, how to do things um, that will have sustainability and be able to uh, provide the services that we need. I think we need uh, more people to be able to be involved in policy and the implications of policy. Uh, I think we need a seat at those tables. And I really would encourage social workers to you know, avail themselves of those resources so that we, they, can, they can impact those areas. So it seems like you continue to be as busy as ever. <laughs> <laughs> You're really not retired. So what new projects are you working on now? <laughs> well, no, you know, it's interesting. Uh, a secondary interest of mine, and again, it stems back from the uh, alternative school I was in where safety was always issue, an issue because I had uh, so many kids that were, you know, involved in, uh, in uh, difficulties with each other. Uh, and then uh, 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 as an EAP with workplace uh, conflicts, and then at the DUI, where you know we have a high degree of high-conflict individuals, uh, workplace conflict has always been kind of an issue that's been uh, important to me. And so uh, Bill Eddy, a good friend, an attorney, and a fellow social worker, and I uh, have written a book, It's All Your Fault at Work, where we really talk about uh, high-conflict personalities, the kind of the continuum of high-conflict personalities. And at the end of that continuum are personality disorders. And it's very interesting because you know, we talk about them, they're defined in our DSM-5, uh, and yet people don't really want to talk about them. They're afraid of labeling, they're afraid of shaming. Um, our, our own mental health community is a little nervous about actually talking about uh, these issues. They're not flattering the signs and symptoms. And yet, people are not functioning well in the workplace. They have these disorders and people don't know how to deal with individuals who have them. And so we hope this book is going to be helpful to de-escalate problems so that we can increase safety in the workplace and then also to provide some um, some tips about how to handle people who have high conflict and how to be able to be more productive in the workplace because of it. So that's that's the area that I'm uh, has, is my latest uh, interest. That's great. I'm wondering if there's anything else that you would like to add. I would just add to to address your passions. I think when you're passionate I think when you're, something really uh, strikes your interest, uh, you'll be able to get through the tough times because you know, you're focused. It's something that you really, really are focused on and uh, if it's your passion, you will do well on it. So I would say if you're passionate about what you're doing, um, you'll get through the adversity because you have a goal and you wanna, I think at the end of the day, you just wanna feel that your life was well lived. Thank you. Thank you for your pearls of wisdom. Thank you, ma'am.